Are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Can you hear me well? I can hear you perfectly well. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, it's been... Where been are you? You're in New York? Yeah, I'm in, in Brooklyn, New York. Uh-huh. Brooklyn, New York. I never heard anybody say that before. Brooklyn? New York. <laughs> yeah, it's. I know it's a very obscure location. And when was the last time you were in Brooklyn? Like, when was the last time you were in Brooklyn? Let me just ask. I haven't been in Brooklyn in forty years. Wow, you would uh, be quite shocked by how much it's changed. May or maybe you wouldn't. I, don't know. I know my daughter. No, I would be. Of course, I would be. Mm-hmm. My daughter, um, uh, who went to NYU film school until uh, a year ago. Spent all. I mean, I realized that all the young people now and a lot of artists and people are living going to Brooklyn, whereas we used to go to the Village or yeah, Lower East Side or wherever. Yeah, I think we're even. So at, I wouldn't recognize Brooklyn. I think we're even getting to the next phase where people can, you know, students like your daughter probably, or like, and I say like your daughter because I don't know your daughter, but you know, are even probably having to look elsewhere too because Brooklyn has become so uh, expensive and. Um, you know, it's just... Yeah, that's, the, the, that's what happens, one place to another. Yeah. So where are they going Where are they going to go next? That is the question. So it, will it be Queens? Will it be uh, Staten Island? I, you yeah, know. I can't imagine. <laughs> I can't imagine, imagine Queens. <laughs> I know. That's a to a hip place to be, but I guess it's all, everything's possible. It's true. Well, there's isn't a couple of... Tr- isn't, that, isn't that where Trump's from, Queens? Don't remind me. Yeah. I, I well, yeah. the bad news, Henry, is that I too admit that I am from Queens originally. I am. Oh, uh, that that helps balance out Trump. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, it reminds me that not everybody from Queens is Trump-like. No. I used to go. I I, I when I was in college, um, I dated a girl for most of my college years who lived in Brooklyn. So I used to always take her home to Brooklyn, and uh, that's what Brooklyn is. My mind is a completely different place that my daughter has described. Right. Well, where was the neighborhood yeah. that your girl? Do you remember the neighborhood your girlfriend lived in? Or yeah, Eastern Parkway. Okay. Yeah. So Crown Heights or something like that, probably. I'm guessing. Yeah. What? Probably like Crown Heights or something like that. I'm guessing. I, I have no idea what the yeah what the comparable yeah <laughs> uh, thing was. neighborhood. So um, this timed out pretty well because actually. I wasn't sure what was going to happen with in terms of talking to you. So tonight, because I just came back from something in Manhattan, and then I got to the last half hour of Rachel Maddow interviewing Hillary Clinton about her new book. So I was glad to catch oh, some of that. Just, you ha- oh, it's, you, you haven't seen it yet? No, no, it was just on here. It was just on, and I caught— It was on last night. It was on last night. Rachel Maddow? Rachel Maddow, yeah. Her oh. interview with Hillary was last night. Well, that's so odd. They ran it again tonight. I guess I I, th- I thought it was today, but you know, maybe. No, it was last night. I saw. I saw oh. it yesterday. It was oh. sensational. Let's talk about that for a second before we get into uh, everything else, and because I'm, I'm as somebody like who specifically has spent so many years and so much of, of his cre- creative energy excavating the the female experience or experiences through that's the female. Good. I like that. <laughs> yeah. The female experience. <laughs> well. I mean, yeah. Truly, I mean, I certainly watched enough of your films to uh, to to state that with great confidence. You know, yeah. You know what an opportunity lost not to have a female president, yeah. And then just especially to, that one. Yeah. So I take you were and an she's advocate. So great. I have I have, I have no understanding of what the people who are against her what what they're talking about. I just never could figure out what they were. Yeah. What was going on? To me, she's spectacular in that interview. So did I stop you from watching the rest of that interview? No, no, no. After the interview? No, no, no. And they'll rerun it later, And even though I'm probably going to try to stay up uh, later. Uh, or I'm I'll... surprised they're running it again today because it was, it was on yesterday. It, that make, yeah, I'm trying to understand how that could be because we get the same uh, it, on MSNBC, Rachel Maddow. Or did you watch it on her being interviewed by a different media outlet? No, no. No, that was Rachel Maddow. Okay. It was a great interview with her. Isn't she great, though, Rachel? Oh, wait Rachel a minute. Ra- wait a minute. Hello. Oh, you're right. You're right. That was, what's his name, on on MSNBC. Not oh. on MSNBC, on CNN. CNN. Uh, you know. Not uh, Anderson Cooper, but somebody else. Yeah, Anderson Cooper. Oh, it was him? That's the one. Oh, he interviewed her before Rachel oh, Maddow? Oh, shit. So, it's, yeah, he, he well, interviewed her before Rachel Maddow. I 
I know. Yeah. That's surprising. And, and then I remember that Rachel Maddow said, Rachel said that she was going to be on the next night. So she, so is it, it I, what time is it now? Well, right now in your, your neck of the woods, it would be quarter after seven. So I, they're going to rerun it again later. Oh. You'll get home. I'll see it later tonight. Yeah, 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 yeah. I won't keep you on that long, for God's sake. No, um, no, no. I see Rachel Maddow when, when it reruns around midnight or one o'clock usually. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't you just love her? Yeah. Oh, my God, I love oh, her. Oh, sensational. She's extraordinary. She's <laughs> really? One of the greatest things that's happened to television. Yeah. And um, But I did see the, what, the, the, the interview with Anderson Cooper and then the discussion afterwards. I didn't. Which so. included Carl Bernstein. Uh, oh right, and yes. Cooper, and, you know, and it was she was just tremendous. Yeah, it's very depressing in a way to realize uh, what we lost, what we what we missed. Very true, and I I hope not you know what we got. Yeah, it, well, that is a rabbit hole that I'm not. Let's not drag each other down that because that's another. Yeah, you know why? Why? And let's let's talk about uh, something a little bit more positive and. Okay, yeah. lead the way out of <laughs> well, the rabbit hole. Let's start with because I, pro- you know, if I'm going to have the most listeners at any point, it's going to be at the beginning, right? Uh, so I hope that I, I assume they'll stick through the whole thing. But I just let's just start with your new film. Just and I know it, I don't even think I don't even see anything about it online yet. But uh, I, you did send me the link to train it. Train to Zakopane, you mean? Train yeah, to the train to Zakopane. Yes. yes because it hasn't opened commercially yet. No, I understand. But it was a play, yeah. clearly. It was a play that ran for a year out here, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, and, for a year. And, uh, just, just, and it just finished running for a tremendous eight months in Israel, which is really amazing. Gee whiz. Uh, they translated it into Hebrew as some very enterprising people uh, because it deals with a subject uh, that is of interest to Israelis, because it deals with anti-Semitism in Poland in the 1920s. Yeah, exactly. And in that sense, it's, it's very different from all my other films, obviously. So um, what can I tell you about that film? Let me ask this. When is it the plan? When is it? When when do you plan to I, release I it? Have, I have no idea. Okay, right. Okay, so I don't I, just... I, I, because I don't, I don't yet know who is distributing it. Right. It is somewhat larger than my own film. It's more commercially uh, structured so that there are people who are contending for it now. So I don't think we're going to distribute it ourselves, and that means I, I have no idea when it'll be, though I expect oh. it'll be at the, in the early part of the next year. Or yeah. It, Probably, yeah, probably at the early part of next year. The, then the beauty part of that is what we could do is leave it for now and, and come back to that maybe at a separate time sure. when when it, is, it does I'll come out. You know, to... that'll be fun. What struck okay. me, what struck me, and, and for those listening, uh, it is it takes almost entirely, not entirely, but almost entirely on a train. And as you already described, no, it, not not entirely. No, no, I said In almost entirely. It's not even almost entirely. It's about less less than half, I'd say, the movie. Is that true? Okay, so I'm just remembering badly, but because I knew, I remember they get off the train, and and there is a. I thought that was kind of a last section, but I guess that's the second act in the play, right? That's exactly okay. Exactly. I thought at first, oh, this. I thought going into it because I didn't read anything about it, but when you sent me the link, I just watched it. That oh, this is like going back now to in a way full circle oh, to you watched you watch the film. Yeah, I know, and then, then, then I'm happy to talk about it. I thought you hadn't seen it. Oh no, no, no! So I saw it. You sent me the link. I watched so, it. Yeah. Okay. So what was it you were saying? Oh, I was just saying that I know this is a personal story, but uh, also it comes full circle in the sense that one of your first films took place on a train. So it was. I thought that's a nice symmetry there too. My tracks. Second film, tracks. With yeah. Dennis Hopper. Yes, that takes place on a largely. That is largely on a train. Yeah. Uh, so, I, there's, that, there's no relationship between those two films. I can't make any, <laughs> any kind of connection on that at all. I was just trying uh, to kind of make a loose connection, that's all. <laughs> yeah, no, there's no connection except that they, uh, you know, the stories both take place on trains. Well, that's a big one, and then so you've how, directed how, them. So did you enjoy seeing it? How did you like it? Yeah, I did. I did. I mean, I first of all, that Tana, again, I... I you know, with each film, she just delivers a deeper performance. So I would say that uh, this was a very demanding. Astonishing. 
Yeah, and this is the yeah. very this is probably the most demanding role for her because it's the least obviously like or you know familiar in terms of her experience. So you know, but I guess they they call it acting for a reason, you know. Yep, they so, sure can call it acting for a reason. And you should you, you should you feel free to you know call her and interview her for whatever. Thank if you. you. Wish to, she'd be happy to talk about it. As we as leading up to the um to when that does get worked out in 2018 or whenever it is, uh, I, sh- I surely will. I surely okay. will. And she's a, a sh- really a sweetheart. So um, it would be a pleasure. Um, yep. It's nice to bring on people that you know are you know just happy to do things like that. So I I appreciate it. How was it from your standpoint? Did, where, how did you shoot the film? Was it was it all on a, a it was still on a set, I assume, right? That the first the we, first act. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's very hard to explain. Okay. I'd, I'd rather not go into the whole detail of that now. But it's it's it was created much more in the editing room uh, than anywhere else, and than any film that I've made, and that and that fascinated me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's that's it's a whole other story, and uh, since I understand, since you, you you said we'll talk about it subsequently, let's not talk about it. That's a right good now. idea. Yeah, that's fine. Um, in fact, it makes sense to to kind of wait till people can actually go see it after they hear us talk about it. Well, you know, you did send me a bunch of films that filled in some gaps for me. So, you know, it was just uh, it was like a just an amazing experience to to immerse myself in that in the, within you know in those films and. There's a few. First, I don't know which ones you've seen. I know. I'm going to t- well. I'll, I'll tell you, so you don't. You're not left at a disadvantage. Well, for for one, I, you sent me S- Sitting Duck. I happen to have a, I have tracks, and I have and and a safe place, uh-huh. or I have a safe place because I have that BBS box, that Criterion, right? Uh, that I stole from Criterion at one point, and then um, I think tracks. Yeah, caught up with tracks on my own. And then you sent me Sitting Ducks, which was just this amazing uh, film. And you, I didn't even recognize you for the first, your first appearance in that film. I was, uh, you were so, um, well, young, <laughs> but, but also, young. Was. <laughs> you were young. It was but 30, uh, well, let's, let's see, it's, it's Sitting Ducks would be 70, 1979, I think, I shot it. So, yeah. what is that, uh, 35 years ago? Yeah, I wow. was young. That's for sure. When, when did you meet uh, Zach Norman? I, I, uh, I know he was in Tracks, so with Dennis Hopper and... Um... He wasn't just in Tracks. He raised the money for Tracks. Ah, okay. What happened was I made a safe place, and after, I, after it came out, it was so attacked by the entire world that nobody would give me money to make another film. And... Um, I had this strange friend, Howard Zucker, who was <laughs> yeah. acting under the name Zach Norman. Yeah, and um, he was he was in the business of distributing, raising money for films in Europe and distributing them. So I asked him to raise the money for my second film since I couldn't get it from any conventional uh, studio. There were only seven studios then, they sh- and each one of them turned me down on tracks. The only thing they wanted less than a movie about Vietnam was a movie with Dennis Hopper that was after he made um, the last picture show and he was sort of anathema to them and I was not much better since the safe place had been a disaster commercially so Zach went out and raised the money oh a million dollars to make that film then um, at the same time my company I was working with BBS Bert Schneider and BBS right had made a doc had made a documentary uh, about the Vietnam War. Yes, I know. Hearts and Minds. Hearts and Minds are one of the and, great classics uh, of all time. And and um, Colombia refused to release it because right. the government to- asked the head of Colombia not to. And Warner Brothers agreed as long as they would be given they could buy the film from Colombia for a million dollars, but they didn't want to spend a million dollars. Zach had raised a million dollars for me to make tracks, and I persuaded Zach, who was not at all political, but nonetheless was kind enough to go along with it, to use that million dollars to um, to distribute hearts and minds. Right. Uh, so that's what we did with that, and I sent Zach back out then to try to raise money once again, and 
by this time, Hearts and Minds had won the Academy Award, and we got a lot of attention. But for tracks, we could only we could only raise a half a million at that point. So we made the film for a half a million dollars, and that's why he's in the film because he said he was guarding his money. <laughs> Well, he says, and I know this firsthand, that uh, in addition to his relationship with you, that being partly responsible for Hearts and Minds is the most important thing he's ever done in his professional life. He's the most proud of yeah, it's it. Nice he feels that, it's nice he feels that way since he didn't want to do it. And he was completely non-political at the time. Understood. And he, he, did, he did it because he's got a very good heart, but he was not at all right. Rick Schneider who produced it and myself who... We were very uh, involved in the anti-war, Vietnam War movement. Zach was completely non-political. So for him to do it was doubly nice. He just did it out of really a kind heart, which is why I've used him in practically every movie ever since. It's true. Was it just, are you just a super loyal guy? Are you just amazing? Are you just... No, he's a, I, think he's a, I think he's a great, funny character. Yes. A great eccentric character. And, a, and that comes in, in many films, that comes in very handy. I could always count on him. Comic relief. A certain kind of off-the-wall off comic relief, exactly. Yeah. Oh, he's certainly... And especially when I, put him, when I put him together with my brother, they're the two most eccentric people. You said you saw Sitting Ducks, right? I saw si Sitting Ducks, yeah. I, I agree. I, their their yeah. chemistry is, is uh, remarkable. Yep, and it was like that in life. And I had them both on the train with me when I was shooting tracks. My brother was, was sort of the guy who was watching the money, and Zach was the guy who had raised the money. And they were kind of watching each other. <laughs> so I, I got to see, and, and at one point, I stuck them in front of the camera, and their chemistry was so good on film that I decided to make Sitting Ducks. What is the experience for your brother, M Michael Emil? What is the experience of, of making a movie? Because it's surprising, given how natural he is. He's so curious and so unique to watch. I mean, he's, he's definitely curious and unique to watch. He, and he's he, very natural, but he's also very, he's very eccentric. So yeah. I just asked him. I just told him, "We're going to put you in different situations. You're going to react the way you would react." And he said, "Okay." So that's what he did in the film. He never memorized a line of dialogue. Um, and just, with, with Zach's help, I, I got this fantastic performance of. You know, I don't mean to dwell on it too much, but I, I want people to. To make a point of seeing it, because there's a scene, one scene in particular, yeah, where, right. yeah, 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 it's uh, oh, that's that's a perfect did... example of what I mean. Because I did not tell my brother that I was going to send Zach in. I didn't think you did. I told my brother, I told my brother to get undressed, get in the bathtub, to do his exercises with that hand gripping thing, right, and that I was going to send in the young woman who he was interested in in the movie just to go on the edge of the tub and get into a conversation with him. That's what I told him to expect. Then I sent Zach in naked to get into the tub next to him. And my brother has certain, um, how should I put it? He, is, he has certain discomfort with a, a nude male too close to him. He'd never experienced that. And I had Zach <laughs> offer, you know, washing him and saying how excited he was to be on the trip with him. And it got my brother crazy and he kept trying to get him out of the tub. And it was all on the first take that I got the best part of that uh, scene. So um, I used my brother for his own peculiar reactive yeah. qualities. The limo is sitting there. Everything is set. We got everything done. Do you think anybody okay? may know about the garage where we're Nobody hidden now? Nobody knows anything. Everything I've ever How done my I whole life the... works smooth. What's the matter with you? Just relax. This is the chance of a lifetime. Simon and Sydney have a plan. We have seven hundred and twenty-four thousand three hundred sixty dollars, not seven hundred fifty thousand. And what's the difference? When you're rich, you're rich. Life has other ideas. The plane's not coming till Monday morning. You swore to me that it would be on Friday. How did I get into this thing with a crazy guy like you? That's a great car, you know. You know how to drive? <laughs> yeah. You want to make some bread? How much bread? They're on the road. Does anybody know where we're going? Does anybody know what road I should be taking? In hot water. What the hell are you doing getting into my bathtub? Get a hooker for 50 bucks. Let's get a couple of broads up here. You're behaving like a deviant. I'm gonna do your leg. And getting in over their heads. Do you ever consider the relationship between peculiar 
offbeat actors. Uh, I, I, I can tell from watching your films that you cast from the gut. You're obviously very active in the casting. I don't know if you hire people uh, to, to cast your films, but it's, I'm, I'm uh, you know. No, I cast them all myself. It's clear, yeah. So I would have been surprised to hear it otherwise. But it, there seems to be a dichotomy between your gut way of of casting and the commercial imper like a commercial imperative. It's like you're going for uh, actors that you you like to work with that uh, charm you on some level, at least artistically, if not personally. <laughs> Karen Black, one of my favorite character actors, and well, she's just beautiful, and what a lovely actress she was. And was in a number of very commercial successes. Don't get me wrong, but again, it's, it it shows like an eye for a particular type of performance. Maybe you know, maybe you can talk about it a little. What 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 attracts you to actors like well, Karen the Black? I chose Karen because Karen Black had been my my second girlfriend in life. Uh, the first one being an actress named Brenda Vaccaro. I don't know if you know who she is. And, <laughs> yes, uh, of course and, I know Brenda and, Vaccaro. And, and, I've seen Midnight Cowboy. Oh, well, good. Wasn't she in that? She's done your homework, so... Was she in that? Wait a minute. Yes, she was. She was, right? Okay. Yes. No, I know Brenda Carcaro. She was a very popular actress for many years. Okay, yeah. well, she was... That was my first girlfriend. Okay. And then Karen was my second. And at the point that I made the, the film you're talking about, Can She Bake a Cherry Pie? Yeah. I was at a very low point emotionally. My first wife had just left me. I was totally depressed. And I thought I needed somebody to sort of play me walking around New York talking to themselves uh, because their their partner had just left them. Yeah. And I sp I just spoke to Karen, who was, as I said, a close friend about that. And she said, let me play you. So I said, okay. And that's what we did. Oh, I see. And now that you mention this and you talk, talk, talk to me about it, uh, or, or you rather you explain it, I, I'm starting to see something maybe beginning to emerge, which is the, you know, the, again, the female perspective and I, yep, and yep, the, for sure, you know, I didn't see it before sure. that. It would never, it, yeah, yeah. It, it, Karen and I have very similar emotional kind of uh, sensibilities, and I knew that she could play basically the me, the internal me of being depressed at being left, and then trying to find a happy ending, starting the movie with an unhappy beginning, which is her walking around Central Park talking to herself, yeah. like I had done when my wife left me. And um, see what would see what would happen, mm -hmm. and uh, that's how we made that film. Is it coming over here? Sure. What's your name? Z. Z. Is that a short name for something, or is that a full name? Do I look real pitiful? No, I'm just sympathetic. I'm. I'm. I'm uh, no, I'm not. I mean. I'm glad you sat here. Do you know, I want a baby? What? I would like to have a baby. Not with you. But I really want one. Emotionally, she's completely unpredictable. That is the guy. What guy? That what is the guy with the cafe. I'm used to being very sure that a woman likes me and me making a choice. In her case, I'm really quite unsure. I think you're very nice. Kind of funny, but very nice. And the more I get to like her, the more uneasy I get about this sort of thing. Point is that you're a little nuts. I want you to understand that there's a direct relationship between hanging upside down like this and my ability in sex. You look around and you say, where am I? What happened? Where am I? My God, who are you? Eli, who are you? Where'd they go? What happened there? I thought, do you know what I mean? She had a remarkable career. She seemed like she just worked with all the great filmmakers of her day. She and was... in that film, I also found uh, Frances Fisher and gave her her first acting part in the movie. Who? Frances Fisher. Oh, Frances Fisher, of course. Right, who would later marry Clint Eastwood? Is that right? Or they were an item anyway, yes. right? Yeah. yeah. No, no, they were married and they have a daughter, Chris. Uh, who's a who's a, an up and coming actress? Yeah, yeah. I was just that's okay. another film. That's a film, you know, called called what? What is that film called? Which one the, of yours? Yes. What film is Francis Fisher in the film? I'm trying to tell oh, you whether you oh. actually do know the film. Oh, <laughs> well, I I think she might have been in shopping or one of the uh, one of the uh, I don't know how you describe that that 
grouping of films, but where uh, the uh, female obsessions. Yeah, well, she was in one of the female obsessions, but it wasn't shopping. It was about the, wanting baby fever. Baby fever, called. baby fever. Yes, of course. I did see. Honestly, I saw it, but it it's already been a month, and uh, I did. You know, part of the thing, Henry, is when you when you binge watch anything. And I watched at least oh, half dozen. You don't know which one is which. Yeah. A little bit, a little bit. Yeah, I mean, well, but your films are. Ooh. I just need to know. I just you just need to let me know as we speak about it which films you have seen, so we won't be speaking about a film you haven't seen. Oh, oh yeah, that's a, a good way to go. <laughs> well, it's you know you talk about your heartbreak, and then the next couple of films actually deal more with that. Always and <laughs> yeah, always was the always yeah. was the deepest examination of that because. Right. Uh, I could not quite deal with it, uh, frankly, completely in in Can You Pick a Cherry Pie, so I needed Karen still to play me. And then after making that, I realized, well, it didn't solve the problem. I think the only way to solve the problem is to make a film with my ex-wife, in which we actually are playing ourselves, and um, go through what we went through during the process uh, at which she, at, at which time she left me, mm-hmm. and that I didn't want her to leave, and so that's when I sort of invented that film. Uh, always, but not forever, as I as we call it. Right, always, but not forever. It's a beautiful film, actually. It's really touching. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's and it's quite an honest film, actually, and uh, and that that that's part of that sort of sequence of films. Which was followed by New Year's Day, which looked at trying to start over after the end of relationships. Which, well, mm-hmm. you know, I finally worked out some of my problems. <laughs> <laughs> problems, yeah. Well, uh, well, you, well you, I don't know if you skipped someone to love, but it, it's it's uh it's in that same time frame, even though it, it's um, you know, you, you're kind of working it out. It's very meta. It's your most meta film in the sense that you're working out things through a, a series of auditions and in a theater that's about to be shut down wait, wait let me i'm trying to remember that's someone to that's someone to love yeah right now w- when did you meet orson wells when i met I, orson wells for my i met him for my first film a safe place okay and then did you just automatically connect with him i mean what what can you describe that relationship because it's obviously one of the most special relationships and important relationships in your life did you did you read did you read the book My Lunches yes, with Orson? I sure did. My my sense was that yeah. was later on though those lunches. Oh yeah, that, yeah, of course that was later on when we yeah. were very very close in the, the last right. few years of his life. Right. No, I I went to New York to um, I to persuade him to be in my first movie. Peter Bogdanovich was a mutual friend of ours, and he arranged the meeting. And when I got to New York, Orson was not hospitable at all. And this, this gigantic man in these huge purple silk pajamas greeted me at the door with a very gruff, what do you want? And I said, I'm trying to persuade you to be in my first film. And he said, where's the script? And I said, well, there isn't going to be a script if you're not in it. So I didn't write the script, but I can tell you what I want you for. He said, if there's no script, I'm not interested. And he tried to shove me out the door as politely as he could. And I said, look, I just flew here from Los Angeles. This was the plaza in New York. And I said, "Uh, you know, you're going to give me an hour of your time. And he said, well, I'll sit here, but I won't listen. (laughs) And I said, it's funny to remember him sitting there crossing his arms, this gigantic Mm. creature in purple silk pajamas. And I started trying to sell him on doing this part of the magician because right. I knew he was in life a magician uh, and uh, who was going to try to make something disappear and uh, and I finally got him I got him I knew I got him when he he looked out of the corner of his eyes and he said what make what disappear and I said <laughs> I'm not going to tell you that unless you do the movie <laughs> so so you, you... He said, well, can I wear a cape and I knew I had him yes you did you were smart. You had a sense of how to get through, like that the magician yes. o- overacting was the, right. was the way in, right? Because he had a child, That's almost exactly like a child, right. an almost childlike yeah, yeah, exactly. love for 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 magic. It's magic, everything to do with magic. Yeah, yeah. Yep, that's how I knew how to land him, and then we did become very close friends. Well, how did that develop? Because he, huh? 
I'm just curious how that developed. Um, obviously, well, the dynamic has to change because on some level you need to uh, no longer be mentor and uh, mentoree or or whatever that, you know, earlier. Well, we, were, we were never like, we were never like that. We okay. were always quite I guess, equal. Uh, yeah. Uh, but but, but um, the big moment came in my, I think it was about my third or fourth day of filming A Safe Place. And Orson had arrived, and I didn't know him very well. As I said, I'd only met him that one time and hired him, and he had arrived days before he was going to do his week's work on the film. And um, he asked me how it was going, and I told him, I don't know if you know this story, I told him that the crew was giving me a very hard time. Have you heard this particular story? No, I don't think so. So I said the crew was giving me a very hard time every time I wanted to shoot something creatively in an interesting and unusual way they kept saying to me and the cinematographer who had just come from love story dick cretina Mm -hmm. said to me it won't it won't cut this won't cut this won't cut and i said well i just want to try this he said but it won't cut and they were tremendously resistant to me first of all it was the, the vietnam war was going on i was this hippie kind of uh with long a long ponytail and white capizio dance shoes and I looked very weird to them, and I was directing my first movie, and I was in unconventional and wanted to do certain things in a very unusual way. And everything I tried to get them to do, they resisted, every single thing. The cameraman said it won't cut. The script supervisor said it won't cut. So when Orson asked me, how's it going? I said, it's very frustrating because they're resisting me on every level. They're saying things won't cut. And he said, listen, next time they tell you that, just tell them it's a dream sequence. <laughs> and I said, it's a dream sequence. Why is it? Never mind. Why just do that? And the next morning, sure enough, on the first setup, I asked them to do this kind of unusual shot, and they said it won't cut. It's not in the script. And I said, it's a dream sequence. And they said, what? Oh, well, then why don't I get on my back? The cinematographer said I could do a beautiful psychedelic. They used the word psychedelic, you know. And, and suddenly they were friendly and easygoing, and for the rest of the shoot, they were dolls. And I said, went to Orson and I said, I can't believe this. Why is this working? Why does that, what does that mean? And he said, you know, these people are very hard working people. They have rules in their life. They get up at a certain time early in the morning. They get to a set. There's a lot of rules to filmmaking. There's rules to their life. The only place they know that are free of rules is in their dreams. So if you tell them it's a dream sequence, they are freed from their conventional concepts of what can be and cannot be done and what is correct and not correct and then they can be free to be creative and in fact they came up with some of the most interesting ideas for me once they were free of that sort of convention Mm -hmm. that something that is real that has to be literal in a certain kind of visual way and there's not been a single movie since then that i haven't used that at one time or another with an actor or with a crew member to try to get them free from a certain inhibition telling them it's a dream sequence. Orson's words have come in handy at every single one of my 20 by now, 20 films, 21 films. That's a great story. It's shocking that you still use it because I was going to say maybe in 1970, when you were shooting, I assume you were shooting A Safe Place around 1970, that, may, you know, you, there were still enough people that come from, uh, an, you know, a, an older mentality in terms of the you know the filmmaking style and even though yes that's what i just said that's what i just it said it is well i understand but the, you you the also the cinematographer s- had come the from, cinematographer had come from doing love story yeah i understand uh, i'm 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 just saying though that things by the late 60s early 70s were shifting in terms of right a lot very quickly so you know you now, were by, by 1970 nothing had shifted yet really okay no yeah I mean, you mean because of Easy Rider? I don't know what you mean. Yeah, I Why guess would, uh, a couple of, a few the films. Studio films were still studio films. This was a Columbia picture. It starred Jack Nicholson and Tuesday Will they ex- and Orson. They expected a normal kind of director, and they oh, yeah. got this kid with a ponytail. This, a hippie. Who had some weird ideas about what to try to do. Yeah. To them, a hippie. So Orson gave me the magic word. I got it. That really uh, enabled me to break through that kind of resistance. And it was a very, uh, a great, great contribution. And as I said, there's not a single movie, and it's, it doesn't matter what decade it is or, or what you think might be popular in films, mm-hmm. there's still a lot of resistance from from traditional crew members to, you know, non-
non-traditional filmmaking. So is it your they sense? Things and they... mm -hmm. Do you think that there was a period in the early 70s where there were enough uh, young directors like yourself, though, that were experimenting where things started, you know, where the crew started to become more at least fam no, familiar? No, they got crews. They, they got different crews. They got European cinematographers who had been right. to a different uh, Nouvelle Vague. They, it was completely... In America, the studio system had just barely registered for the blip, and then they got very much back to their convention. Uh, that's a good setup, point. So. That's a good point. All the Czech, all the Czech cinematographers were shooting for the American filmmakers, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah good. but I have gotten Dick Cretina from, a love, from Love Story. Love I Story. Get one yeah. of the Czech photographers. <laughs> yeah. My uh, point was that Orson figured out how yeah. to bypass right. uh, the conventions of the time and was enormously, I mean, it was it was a huge help to me because I was really at a loss at that point. And then you realize, well, maybe I can start to do the same thing and with other challenges that come up, find those bypasses, that there, that that's a way to go. Just try to find the bypass that'll work for whatever challenge you're you're dealing with. Yeah, yeah, you know? of course. Yeah, I guess that's what you that's what directing is kind of all about. You know, it's the solutions, right? It's a series of solutions, yeah, exactly. right? Yeah. Then starts the uh, series of these films that, you know, I mean, with some, I guess, some exceptions like Deja Vu and a few others, but that, that which another one I really loved, but that, that were dealing with women's, uh, uh, I guess, issues, issues, issues. I, I guess issues. Yeah, I guess it is issues. I'm trying to find the exact right word, but issues covers it just, just fine. Did you get a lot of? Uh, I mean, did the the women coming in and uh, the, that you you cast and the, did people understand what you were doing? Did you understand what you were doing when you started making these films and uh, like nobody else was doing that? Did I, did I, did I understand what I was doing? Yeah, well, I, I mean, that's what I was doing. You know what I'm saying? I, I mean, I, I, I yeah, let me answer you. Yes, please. I felt very aware that women were barely addressed in films at that time, that films were being made by men, mm -hmm. for men, actually by men with a very boy-baby boy kind of mentality for some 16-year-old boy in the Midwest who would go and see it over and over again. And uh, I, it seemed to me that women were being completely ignored by American filmmaking. So what I had wanted to do from the very beginning was try to use film as a way to make people help people feel less alone in life since i'd gone through my own stuff and uh felt that women were bare, sort of barely recognized as what they were going through in terms of the the filmmaking of the period and so that that was the reason that i actually started i first wrote the play, a safe place and then made the movie a safe place and made the subsequent films to try to make women you know, help women feel less alone when they're sitting in the movie theater. That 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 uh, they they to let them know that it's going to be okay. Kind of to let them know. According to there was a there was a wonderful record by the Firestein Theater. I don't know if you know who they are. Called they're all bozos on this bus, and uh, to let them know that we you know we're all going through this kind of same trip. And um, to make them feel less alone, it's like they're the only ones going through it. That was the, sort of the goal of a safe place, and many of the female-centric films that I did. Did you find that that men were relating to the films as well? I mean, did you find that? Uh... No, not at all. Hmm. No, men were walking out. We got complaints from all when, when the most successful of those films, which arguably was Eating, um, all over the country. We got complaints from movie theater managers that men were like walking out of the movies and that the women were getting into arguments and and, uh, and women started going with their friends or with their mothers or you know uh, the whole second wave of filmmaking was fascinating because there were practically no men in the audience uh, men reacted so badly to the film and women so well and uh, it was a fascinating thing to discover. What about in, in Europe? Were these distributed in Europe? 
yes, the, mm -hmm. the Safe Place was very successful. The only one of my films that was a huge success in France um, and quite successful in England uh, because they, they had a separate culture in terms of film as an art form. Uh, that I didn't. I don't think that had anything to do with male and female. That had more to do with the idea of film as entertainment or art. And they were willing to look at film as poetry, for instance, uh, which is what the French critics all called it, rather than as a linear and conventionally unfolding narrative, which is what American filmmaking was about. Did, Still is largely about. I, I guess uh, when you showed films like Eating and baby fever in in europe i'm just wondering what the reception was to those films it, it's been very very good very positive uh strange places where you don't expect that why why my films should be very popular in poland for instance i have no idea you never figured that uh, out but they are mm -hmm. no i can't i can't <laughs> figure that out or czechoslovakia the czech republic as it now is uh it's just fascinating no it's just very interesting i i, I can't quite make any you know, consequential discoveries as a result of it. Just that there, I think the biggest thing is that Europeans have been from the beginning willing to understand film as art, yeah. film as something other than just storytelling and uh, in the conventional sense. And American audiences never have, never really have. Though there was a brief period there in the early 70s where it looked like things were going to change. It did. It did seem like that. Yeah. I mean, it did seem like that. And, it's a it's it's amazing how uh i mean how, I, how old how old are you i'm 53 uh -huh. so i i mean so i in 70 you were you weren't born were you born yeah yeah so i let's see i was i would have been coming i would have been a teenager what, in the 70s what year were you born 63 53 63 63 yeah. two two months before 63. Well, 63 two months before you know kennedy was assassinated so, so I was alive. Yeah, that was my my president. Uh, <laughs> you know, but you know, but I my parents, Henry, my parents were very, very into films. You know, so I grew up, and they were playing films by uh, Henry Jaglum, and I have to say that I mean, you know, it's uh, though, but they uh, also Antonioni and 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 you know Fellini, and they loved Bergman. Well, you're lucky you had you had. That's good that you had that background. Yeah. 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 So. You know when well, then, you, then you understand how completely different films were there than they were here, and what the expectancies of audiences were. Yeah, yeah, and I grew up with you know this has had a big impact on the kind of films that I was comfortable with and that I would be attracted to. So, you know, um, and mm -hmm. but I and I remember I the my older cousins and you know parents were in you know when like a movie like. Uh, you know, again, Midnight Cowboy or 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 Taxi Driver, any of those types of films were coming out. Like they were on everybody's radar. You know, we I knew about. Uh -huh. I, you know, I was living in New York, so they were. It was like playing all over the place. It wasn't only because my parents were you know interested in that um, as they were art artists themselves. So that you know, just uh, I was very lucky in that way. So I've always been interested in in the character driven film myself. It's you know. Probably, which is why you're now writing about film or, or yeah. doing programs about film. Yeah, all yeah. the above, exactly. Right, sure, sure. And um, always grateful when I um, when I come across a film that that you know still manages to pull it off. Is I remember also you recently sent me links to some letters that you that blew my mind. Your correspondences with Ilya Kazan. Letters. Oh, my exchange with Kazan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, about it? I read these correspondences, and I'm wondering. Uh, to, just I want you to talk a little bit about it because it's so incredible. About Kazan? Yeah, and just about how this started, and you and you 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 say in your letters early on, "I hate you and I love you," and it's it's you know, and he was just very open no, to. No, I, I didn't say that. I didn't say I love you. I said I I hate you, and I love your your films and I loved your book that I just read is the best book I've ever read about theater and film and I don't understand the contradiction between the disgusting human being that you you are and this brilliant book that you've written which is the best book about film and uh, and theater which is his autobiography a life have you read it yeah uh, uh, Ilya Kazan a life yeah how do you 
did you just assume that when you say something like, and by the way, I'm in agreement with you because he named names. I, I totally get it. Uh, 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 did you expect him to write back and be so uh, open minded about, you know, an understanding about the, this dichotomy and your take on no, him? I had no, I had no idea, but we both came from the actor studio. So I knew we had that in common. And, um, his book was so brilliant that I just thought I would be honest with him and say, you know, you're a shit. And to people like myself, you're the epitome of, of the worst things that people have done in Hollywood history. And uh, on the other hand, you make the best films of anybody of that. As I was growing up, there, were, there was nobody else like Kazan at all. And that was before, before Kubrick and before, you know, the, the Europeans, before Fellini and... Mm-hmm. And Antonioni and all of that. Kazan was making brilliant films, and yet he was this disgusting human being. So I said to him, "You are a shit. It's an article of faith in my life that you're a shit, and yet you've written this best book. And I don't know how to reconcile that." And he wrote back. He was interested in my letter, and we. And he ended up wanting to meet me. So I ended up meeting him, and that's what those letters are a document about. What what was it like to finally to to indeed meet him? It was confusing uh, because I liked him very very much, and um, that was disturbing. It was I, I lost I lost a couple of friends because of that. Did you? Um, yeah, because I had a when my wife had our first daughter who was pregnant with our first child. Um, I gave a party for her at Vivica Linfer's house. You know who Vivica Linfer is? You, did you see Last Summer in the Hamptons? Yes, I know who I know who she is. She's a great character actress. Um, uh, did you see Last Summer in the Hamptons? That one I did not see, but that's the only probably the only one. Oh. But I know I've seen I've seen a number of I know the actress. I, I will watch it. I and I, I you know yeah, I could have said I did see it, but uh, I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, let but let it's go ahead. It definitely go ahead. I apologize. I talk? Yep. No. Go ahead. Please finish the story. So I gave a party for some my New York friends to meet my my comparatively new wife, who was then pregnant with our first child. And Vivica Linfers, who I'd become friendly with in East Hampton and had not yet made the movie with, uh, uh, said, use my, my, my townhouse for the party. I said, great. So I invited her to that. In the meantime, I had the encounter with Kazan and liked him. So I invited him, since he was on the same street as Vivica, in a little house nearby. I had not known that they had been walking their dogs for 30 years and not talking to each other oh. uh, because of what he had done. And he came to the party, and half the people there got furious at me for inviting him, including Jules Pfeiffer, who I'd been very friendly with, who wouldn't talk to me after that uh, because I'd invited Kazan. Um, they oh, these people, mostly the older ones who had suffered more directly from Kazan's disgusting behavior, could not forgive him, of course. And I had been naive enough to think, you know, time had gone by, it was all right to invite him to this party for my, to meet my, uh, my new wife, and my new pregnant wife. So um, that's, you know, that was, that was, it was quite a, a quite an important thing for me to realize that this wasn't just a past situation, but in many people's lives, this was a very big and real, you know, very real, continuous. You really should see uh, last summer in the Hampton before we talk about this. I, I'm going to watch it. I'll watch it tonight. I'll watch yeah. it tonight because it deals with that in, during the film itself. You'll see why. When okay. You see it. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, I don't know what else to tell you about Kazan except that uh, well, it was interesting and complicated. Well, did Orson was Orson was Orson was furious at me when he learned later that I had done that too, and he said that he could never one thing he could never forgive was Kazan, I just could never look at him again, and I certainly understood that. Yet some people can and, reckon, uh, some people can make can draw the distinction, I guess, because you know. No, but for me it was not real because it was, he was he you know he was a villain of my childhood. And not my contemporary life, so I didn't have the same response. You know, 
I knew intellectually that he was a horrible human being who had done horrible things, but I had not quite, once I got to know him and like him, it had, I'd forgotten yeah. who he really was and what it would mean to these other people to invite him to this party, and it, it ruptured several of my closest friendships with older people. Did you uh, were you able to to uh, go back and 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 patch up any of those relationships? Because some of them, yeah, yeah, some of them, of yeah. course, I was, but yeah. Vivica Lynch, as I certainly was, I had not yet made the movie with her, right? Which which I'll watch. But, um, mm-hmm. What? Yeah, I said which I will absolutely watch. It has to, yes, c- of course, it will be the one be we dwelled on, the one that you know that the one that I I didn't get to. Thanks very much. Yeah. <laughs> it's the one that's, that kicks me in the ass. That's, that's, that's the way life is. But it's curious because on a different scale, Henry, I, I grappling, I have a niece who voted for Trump, and I don't, you know, my sister, uh, it's come up in the family. You, it's, voted, you voted for Trump? No. I have a niece. What did you just say? My niece. Was, my niece. Need? My niece. My sister's need? daughter. Yeah. My sister's okay. daughter. Okay. And who's a grown woman? For Trump. And, yeah. So yeah, there's so many enough. levels to it that. So there's been. I'm going to be real brief about it because it's not about my family, but the, that it's caused a number. It comes up. You know, people feel very, very impassioned about it. So it's come up and it's caused rifts and it's causing complications. You know, yeah, and my si- and my sister is at a loss. She's caught in between a rock and a hard place. But it's it's I I guess what I'm doing on a smaller scale is she didn't name names she's not villain but you know she's young and uh, you know uh, but but it's it's interesting you have to you have feelings for somebody love in my case and yet they're you know they've aligned themselves with somebody very despicable so uh, it's it's a really complicated issue and you know. I don't know if right or wrong is even the w- way to describe it, but uh, I could see that you put yourself in a in, by by uh, becoming entangled with when, and friends with him. Yeah, it's it puts you in quite a an, a very difficult place. I really appreciate okay. you know you're taking the time. Uh, not at all. You know, I mean, it, for me, My it's pleasure. a me too. I mean, I I just somebody who's created so many inc- just remarkable films and. Give, devoted their life to making art uh, like you. It's it's a thank you. Yeah, really. You know, but do see last summer in the Hamptons. Okay, I'm, I'm, I have a copy on me, as you well know. After we say goodbye, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna put it on tonight. Waiting for Rachel it's Maddow. About, it's about exactly that about making art. It's right. Exactly about that. Yeah. More than any of the other films, I would say it's about that. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. It's uh, good. Very good speaking with you. If you need anything or want anything else, give me a call. I will. Thank you very much. And we'll talk again, you know, around um, Zach Pane and um Whenever you want, just get back in touch with me, okay? All right. Thank you very much, Henry. Okay. It's a pleasure. All right. Have a good Bye. night. Bye-bye now.